In the course of our work on amyloid fibril structures, we discovered that uh, not all amyloid fibrils have the same structure. So depending on exactly how the fibrils are grown, the precise conditions under which they develop, there are significant variations in their molecular structures. And we, just, we found this first in uh, fibrils that are just prepared in vitro, uh, just using synthetic peptides or recombinant peptides and just growing fibrils in simple buffers in the test tube, you know, on the bench in the laboratory. And uh, so when we, we, you know, we, we realized that, that, uh, that there were actually were significant differences, it was highly sensitive to the precise conditions, we were able to characterize some of those structural differences, develop structural models for fibrils that were prepared in different ways. And then an obvious uh, extension of that was to wonder whether the same thing actually happens in, in brain tissue, in, in, uh, in you know, human cortical tissue. Or, you know, does people who develop amyloid plaques in their brains, those plaques are composed of amyloid fibrils. Is it always the same fibril structure or, or could there be variations in those structures? And if there are variations, could those variations have consequences? So is it possible that uh, for whatever reason, certain molecular structures end up being more neurotoxic than others could be a direct effect having to do with the types of chemical uh, groups that are exposed on the surface of the fibrils that may vary from one fibril type to another and produce different toxicity or some indirect effect some fibrils may uh, have different mechanical properties some some fibrils may break up more easily than others and actually we saw that in our in vitro experiments depending on how you grow the fibrils you can get fibrils that are tougher than others some of them you can break up very easily by just putting them in a test tube and putting a little stir bar in, stirring them gently, and they break up. Other fibrils don't break up so easily. So that uh, you, just fragmentation could affect the biological uh, uh, properties because uh, perhaps fibrils that are fragmented more easily can spread through the brain more easily. So things like that it could be some a direct effect, could be an indirect effect. So we we we, we sort of hypothesize that there that there might be an effect, and then we so that. Uh, drove us to wonder how can we actually do measurements? How can we actually do molecular structural measurements on fibrils that come from brain tissue? And uh, <clears throat> so it turns out there's some limitations of the methods that we use. There's a couple of important limitations. One is that we need relatively large quantities of material. We need milligram quantities of amyloid fibrils. From brain tissue samples, we can get micrograms. But uh, perhaps more importantly, the fibrils that we do our solid state NMR measurements on, uh, we observe signals uh, from particular isotopes of elements. So we observe in particular signals from carbon-13 isotopes. Most carbon is carbon-12. Only about 1% is carbon-13 normally. Or from nitrogen-15. Most nitrogen is nitrogen-14. We observe signals from nitrogen-15, which is less than 1% abundance. So to actually do our measurements, we need to introduce the carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 uh, isotopes. We need to label the fibrils with carbon-13 or nitrogen-15 to do the solid-state NMR. And obviously, the material, the fibrils that develop in brain are not isotopically labeled, so we can't actually do measurements directly on brain tissue. But what we uh, realized we could do was use uh, amyloid that comes from brain tissue as a seed for growing fibrils using peptides that are isotopically labeled. Then the fibrils that grow from the seeds will be isotopically labeled. And simultaneously, we're amplifying the quantities when we do seeded fibril growths. So we worked on uh, protocols for, for doing that.